Well, amen. It is good to be here and good to be with folks that are listening in on Blog Talk Radio or through Facebook, or through iTunes, or however they may have found us. We're grateful for them being here with us this morning at Faith Baptist Church, and it's good to be here on this last day of winter, right? Last, you know, that's, that's the wondrous thing of God. He created these seasons for us to enjoy. And and we truly get something out of each one of them. I know there's folks that don't like winter and there's folks that don't like summer and, and all that in between. But, you know, it's hard to argue with spring unless you got allergies. Amen. <laughs> but it's hard to argue with everything becoming beautiful again, you know. And that's, you know, that's a great thing about this life. There are seasons of life, too. There are times when when you feel like you're in the spring and everything's new and everything's wonderful. And there are times when it feels like everything's beating down on you like the hot summer sun. There are times when it feels like everything's starting to die, and it's time to feel like everything died on you. But you know what? God, if you just wait around, you just keep looking for the sun to come. Amen. One of these days, it's going to be springtime all over again. And I ain't just talking about spring weather. I'm talking about the Lord's coming. Amen. All right. We're going to get into our, back into our, our series of getting to know Jesus this morning. And we're in part 22. Doesn't seem like we've done that this many weeks, does it? Really, to me, it doesn't seem like 22 weeks. It seems, it seems to me like it's been four or five. But, uh, time will get by on you in a hurry. Doesn't seem like we've been meeting over here in this location since, uh, July the 13th either, but, but we have. It's, or maybe it was the next week. Maybe it was the 20th was the first week we met here, but still been a long time since we started meeting here. Uh, we're going to turn in our Bible. We're going to turn to a couple places. I want you to find, first of all, find Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. Find that first. And then we're going to turn over, way back over in the Old Testament to the book of Second Chronicles. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, and then First and Second Chronicles. It helps that I memorized all that. If you memorize the books of the Bible, it it will greatly help you in finding what you're looking for. When I was in vacation Bible school a long time ago, I learned all the books of the Bible in order, and uh, I'm not going to quote them to you this morning, even though I've done that in the past. Um, but I can say them pretty fast. You And I'm not bragging on myself. I'm just telling you, if you apply yourself, you can learn things. And uh, so anyways, have you found Matthew 12? Yeah. All right. Have we found Second Chronicles? Second Chronicles 6.14. Second Chronicles 6.14. If you found that, we're going to start there. We're going to read there, and then we're going to turn to First Peter after that. Second Chronicles six fourteen. The Bible says in Second Chronicles six fourteen, and said, "O Lord God of Israel, there is no god like Thee in the heaven, nor in the earth, which keepest covenant." First of all, God's not going to break His word. Amen. And showeth mercy unto Thy servant that walk before thee with all their heart. God is a God that shows mercy to his servants. Aren't you glad that we serve a God that's a merciful God? I tell you what, I, I, and, I, when I, and I know that there is no God called Allah, but when I see these Muslims and what they believe, and they, ha they don't have any mercy in their religion. Uh, they have a religion that's a punishing religion. It's a it's a destroying religion. It's not even a religion. It's a political ideology, but that's beside the point. The point is it passes off as a religion, and again, people are punished constantly. God is a God of mercy. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse... We're going to look at a few verses before we, before we get to our main text. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3. I just want to look at the fact that God's merciful. Amen. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. The Bible says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ 
from the dead. Amen? Let's look at that for just a second and see what that says to us. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy. God didn't have to save us. God could have thrown us away in, in a trash can uh, called hell and started over and made a whole other batch of people if that's what he had decided to do. But that's not what God's will was. He was a he he's a God of mercy. He's a God of abundant mercy. That means there's way more than you need available. Understand that. Abundant, again, it means everything is full inside the bounds. And he's gone he goes beyond the boundaries. He goes further than you ever expected. And because of his abundant mercy, he's begotten us again unto a lively hope. That means this world is not the end. This world is a is a hard place. It can be a sad place. It can be a tiring place. It can be a place of anguish. But I can tell you something. It's not the end. We are looking forward to a lively hope. We're looking forward to a trumpet blast. We're looking forward to a, to a come up hither. Amen. I'm looking forward to that. By the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Because he came out of the grave. Praise God. I don't have to fear the grave. I don't have to fear death. Because that death has no sting. It has no power over me. Because of what my Lord and Savior has done for me. Amen. And I like verse 4. I think I'll just read it. It wasn't in there in my text. But it says, To an inheritance incorruptible. What God has waiting on me because of his mercy, it's there and nothing can destroy it. Amen. And it's undefiled. There's nothing wrong, nothing dirty, nothing nothing odd about it. And it fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. Isn't that good? That's some get I mean, that ought to make you happy this morning. To know that the devil cannot touch what God has laid up in store for you in heaven. There's nothing that you or I can do to mess that up, what's in store for us in heaven. And the devil, nothing down here can destroy what God has laid up for us. Praise God. Now I want us to turn to Psalm, and when we turn to Psalm 136, then we'll get to our main scripture after that. But uh, uh, again, the first two passages we read, the Bible says that, that God shows mercy to his servants. And then verse 3 of uh, 1 Peter 1 said that he is and according to his abundant mercy. And I want us to look at what the psalmist wrote, wrote here this morning in, uh, in Psalm 136. I know it's a little bit lengthy, but we're going to read it together. And I'm going to ask you to read that second line of every verse. I'll read the first part of it. You read the second. It's the same in every single verse. Psalm 136. Have you found Psalm 136? All right. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. Help me. For his mercy endureth forever. Oh, give thanks unto the God of God, for his mercy endureth forever. Oh, give thanks to the Lord of lords, for his mercy endureth forever. To him who alone doeth great wonders, for his mercy endureth forever. To him that by wisdom made the heavens, for his mercy endureth forever. Read it with us. To him that stretched out the earth above the waters, for his mercy endureth forever. To him that made great light, for his mercy endureth forever. The sun to rule by day, for his mercy endureth forever. The moon and stars to rule by night, for his mercy endureth forever. To him that smote Egypt in their firstborn, for his mercy endureth forever. And brought out Israel from among them, for his mercy endureth forever. With a strong hand and with a stretched out arm, for his mercy endureth forever. To him which divided the Red Sea into parts, for his mercy endureth forever. And made Israel to pass through the midst of it, for his mercy endureth forever. Who overthrew Pharaoh and his hosts in the Red Sea, for his mercy endureth forever. To him which led his people through the wilderness, for his mercy endureth forever. To him which smote great kings, for his mercy endureth forever. And slew famous kings, for his mercy endureth forever. Sihon, king of the Amorites, for his mercy endureth forever. And Og, king of Bashan, for his mercy endureth forever. And gave their land for an heritage, 
for his mercy endureth forever. Even a heritage unto Israel his servant, for his mercy endureth forever. Who remembered us in our lowest state, for his mercy endureth forever. And hath redeemed us from our enemies, for his mercy endureth forever. Who giveth food to all flesh, for his mercy endureth forever. O oh, give thanks unto the God of heaven, for his mercy endureth forever. What do you think David's trying to let us know? I think he's trying to let us know that God's mercy endures forever. Amen? Listen, he wanted us to know that so much that he added it to every single verse of Scripture there. God wanted us to know that. And David, his servant, wanted us to know that God is a God of mercy. Matthew chapter 12 this morning. Matthew chapter 12. Reckon you have an idea what we're going to focus on today? We're getting to know Jesus, aren't we? We're getting to know that Jesus is a merciful God. Amen. Matthew chapter 12, verses 9 through 21 be our text this morning. The Bible says, and, he, and when he was departed thence, he went into their synagogue. And behold, there was a man which had his hand withered. And they asked him, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day? They might accuse him. And he said unto them, What man is there that be among you, shall there be among you, that shall have one sheep? And if it fall into a pit on the Sabbath day, will he not lay hold on it and lift it out? How much is then is a man better than a sheep? Wherefore is it lawful to do well on the Sabbath day? I'm sorry, that's a statement. Wherefore it is lawful to do well on the Sabbath days. Then saith he to the man, Stretch forth thine hand. And he stretched it forth. And it was restored whole like as the other. Then the Pharisees went out and held a council against him, how they might destroy him. And when Jesus, But when Jesus knew it, he withdrew himself from thence, and great multitudes followed him, and he healed them all, and charged them that they should not make him known, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, Behold my servant, whom I have chosen, my beloved, in whom my soul is well, well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him, and he shall show judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not strive nor cry, neither shall any man hear his voice in the street. A bruised reed shall he not break, and a smoking flax shall he not quench, till he send forth judgment unto victory, and in his name shall the Gentiles trust. Let's go to the Lord this morning in prayer. <coughs> Our Father, well, Lord, we come before you this morning, and Lord, we need you to stay. Father, we praise you for your for your wonderful, incredible goodness and mercy. Thank you, Father, for this precious book, Lord, that teaches us everything that we know about you. Thank you so much for the Holy Ghost that guides us as we study. Thank you, Lord, so much, Lord, for the, the, the ones that are gathered here in our midst. Lord God, we thank you for those that are gathered by way of the Internet. Lord, we pray that we be a blessing to each and every one that hears. Lord God, I pray, Father, that you work in our lives. Lord, that you work through our understanding and down deep in our in our heart of hearts. Lord, I pray that you would that you would show us, Lord, that, that Father, that you you got us. Lord, you're not going to ever let us go. And Father, you want to grow us. You want to make us into what you want you want us to be. You want to make us like Christ. Lord, teach us to be listeners. Teach us to be teachable. Father, I pray that, that the Holy Ghost of God would take control now and guide me, my thoughts, and my words, my actions. Lord God, that folks be blessed by what they hear. Lord, I pray that your hand be upon me. You'd forgive my sins. You'd cleanse me and fill me. Lord, please use me. I know I'm nothing, but Lord, just, just a vessel. Fill this vessel and pour me out. Lord, let me be a blessing to somebody else. Lord, I pray for the one that's lost. I pray for their salvation. Pray for the one that's cold and backslidden. Lord, to this be the day they wake up and begin to live and feel again. Lord God, I just pray, Father, for the one who's down and depressed. Lord, that this be the day they lift their eyes up and put their eyes upon you and have life in them again. Lord God, I pray that you'd bless now. Help us and meet with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. All right. Matthew chapter 12. <clears throat> 
what we just read. The Bible said, and when he was departed from thence, you remember where he was? Where was he at? Somebody tell me where he was at. Hmm? He was going through a field, wasn't he? With his other, with his, his, they were picking grain and shucking it in their hands and eating it. And the, and and the Pharisees, well, they said, now, wait a minute, wait a minute, hold on, we don't like you no more because you keep showing us up everywhere we go. Uh, we don't like you because you teach the Word of God, and it's a whole lot different than when we teach it. We don't like you because you're able to to heal people, and you got more followers than we do now. We don't like you because you claim to be God. You claim to speak for God. You claim that God's your father. How do you, uh, who, you're blas- you, he, He's a blasphemer in their eyes. It's amazing, isn't it? I mean, it's, it's, it's God's religion. Amen. He, he created it for them to see that they couldn't walk in it. He created it for them to see that they needed him. He created it so that they would see that, the, that they needed the Messiah who was to come, and they should have recognized him. But they didn't because of the blindness of their own hearts and the coldness of their own hearts. And so what they did is they accused him. Just like man does today when somebody preaches the Bible and they say, you're preaching hate, not love. You're preaching hate. Because you preach against somebody's sin, people get mad at it. They don't want to hear about it. They don't want to know that they need to be saved. Amen? But that's not what I come to talk about this morning. It's immediately after this confrontation, where Jesus told them, listen, the Son of God is the Lord of the Sabbath day. They were saying, you can't do that because you're doing it on the Sabbath day, and you're you're to honor God on the Sabbath day. And he's trying to tell them, look, you think that just because somebody's doing uh, somebody's doing uh, something on the Sabbath day that they're breaking the law that, of, of Moses, but they weren't because they're following Jesus. They're, they're seeking to do his will, and they're hungry, and along the way they're taking that and getting nourishment so they can continue on serving God. And, and, and him healing on the Sabbath day, that's not him dishonoring the Father's law by, by doing some kind of work on the Sabbath day. He's honoring God. All that he does honors the Father. There's no way to dishonor the Father in honoring the Father. You understand? There's just no way you can do that. So, <clears throat> again... Don't think it's strange when people are, are are cool to you because you're a Christian. If they don't warm up to you because you're a child of God, uh, there's lots of fair weather people that cry, claim they're Christians who are Christians on Sunday alone. That's what they that's what they portray themselves to be. There's plenty of people that'll get up and get dressed and wear their nicest clothes and go show out for somebody else and 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 and, and are not really there to meet with God. There's plenty of those, and that's sad, but that's the truth. <coughs> But, folks, I'm going to tell you something. If you try to live as a believer, you try to walk it, you try to follow it, people are not going to like you. They're not. So they didn't like him, right? They hated him because he was the truth. And, there, and they lived in error. And, though, and you try to walk in that same truth, and you watch how quick those who are walking in error quit liking you, quit wanting to have anything to do with you, and will talk about you, and and try their best to find a way to trip you up and say, oh, look at you, you're a hypocrite. You don't believe what you say you believe. So just just throwing that out there. Jesus wants us to learn of him. So as we're learning, we're finding out all kinds of things about him. And this morning, I want us to look again at the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we'll look at our text. Verse 9, when he was departed thence, he went into their synagogue. Okay, now let's see, where was he at at this time? Where was Jesus at? when he went into their synagogue. Let's look and see here. So, all right, well, he's in Galilee. That's where he's at. He's made his way back to Galilee. All right, he's been to Jerusalem for the Passover. They left the Passover. They were passing through the grain fields on their way back to Galilee. So they're back in Galilee now. So the Bible said he, he went into their synagogue. And behold, there was a man which had his hand withered. And and they asked him, saying, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day that they might accuse him? So they're in the synagogue somewhere. There's a man there, and his hand is is, is drawn up. It's, it may, be, may have been small, withered, maybe never fully developed. And it doesn't say that he was in, in pain. It doesn't say that there was anything wrong with him other than the fact that his hand was withered. Matter of fact, he probably made it, learned how to do more with his other hand. I mean, he was probably functioning. He wasn't in a life or death situation. But still, he was hindered because of that withered hand. And 
if you'll notice there, Jesus didn't seek him out. <coughs> what happened was the Pharisees, they found a guy who needed healing. They brought him to Jesus. Said, hey, look here, Jesus. What about him? Right? What about him? Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? They thought, well, we're going to get him again, and we're going to set him up here that they might accuse him. And he said unto them, Lord used an analogy to try to get them to see the bigger picture. He says, "Which man? What man of you? And what man shall be among you that shall have one sheep?" I noticed that he had one. <laughs> he had one sheep. So that sheep pretty precious to him, isn't it? And if it fall into a pit on the Sabbath day, he doesn't say what kind of pit, but long enough, deep enough for him to probably be bellering out and trying to get attention, right? I mean, you imagine there's a pit out in your backyard, the sheep falls in it. It'd be, bah, bah. you can't listen to that all day, right? That'd get on your nerves after a while. And say, will he not lay hold on it and lift it out? I can just picture a man sitting in his house. His wife said, you going to get that sheep out of that hole? Nah, I'm going to wait till tomorrow. No, you go out there right now. I'm tired of listening to that thing bellered. <laughs> I mean, I can just picture it in my mind. Hey, well, all right, I'll go out there and get it, I guess. So. They get the sheep, uh, you know. Jesus said, who isn't going to do that, right? Who's going to sit there and just listen to it so we can't do it? No. He said, how much then is, is a man better than a sheep? I mean, this man over here, he, he, he's not in a pit, but his hand's withered. He's not able to use it. And Jesus said, isn't that man better than a sheep? I mean, you'd go, you'd go out of your way to help him and nobody criticize you. But here I am going to love this man enough to heal him, and you look at me like I'm doing something wrong. Then saith he to the man, stretch forth thine hand. And he stretched it forth, and it was restored whole like the other. Did you notice Jesus didn't touch him? Jesus did not lay a finger on him. Jesus did not do anything to that man but do this. He spoke, stretch forth thine hand. Can I tell you something? If God does anything, he is going to do it by his word. Somebody says, Oh, well, I had this kind of experience. Well, if it don't line up with the Word of God, it's fully on your experience. Can I tell you something? The devil will give you an experience if it'll keep you out of the Word of God. I can tell you what, that's evidenced by some of the churches around and some of the crazy things that go on in them. That ain't in the Bible, amen? It's an experience. And people say, oh, I'm more spiritual than you because I've had this experience. God is not looking for that. God wants you to yearn after him. He's not looking for you to have some experience so you can wear a, wear a little patch like the Boy Scout saying, I've had this experience, you hadn't had it, right? See, that's prideful. God's not looking for that. Listen, God, God, want, God wants you to seek after him. That's what he wants. So according to the word, according to his word and what he said, it happened. Amen? And again, if, you want, if, you, if you're praying for something, if you're asking God to do something, I urge you, find it in his word. And claim it before his, mind, before his face. God, your word says this. So I'm claiming this promise before you today. And I'm asking you, Lord, I'm asking for this. Listen, that's the way to get things from God. Take his word before he will honor his word. It may not happen at the snap of your fingers. Don't get upset if it don't happen right when you want it to happen. Don't say, well, God ain't going to do it. I asked it. It didn't happen. Just because you snap, God ain't going to jump. But when God's ready, he will honor his word. Amen? Now, let's keep going. we got a long way to go. All right. Then the Pharisees went out. And the Bible says, and they held a council against him. So they all got in an unholy huddle. And they said, how can we get rid of this guy? Look at what he did. He dishonored the Sabbath. He blasphemed God. He's blasphemed the law. He's a, he's a criminal. Let's get rid of him. Let's find a way to destroy him. They were evil in their hearts. Evil in their hearts. But I want you to listen to this. So here they are. They're out there plotting to kill him. And the Bible says, but when Jesus knew it, and Jesus knew it because Jesus knows what's in a man's heart. He withdrew himself from there, so he left the temple instead of sticking around for the trouble to break out. Amen. That's something we ought to pay attention to, by the way. Whenever the, Jesus wasn't a coward. I don't want you to get to thinking that Jesus left because he was scared, because Jesus wasn't scared of anything. Amen? He left because he did not want to create a scene over 
over a dispute. The Lord left because he had other things to do, better things to do than stand around and argue with somebody. The Lord wasn't going to argue anyway. He would have just gave them his word, but they weren't ready to hear it. So listen, when somebody ain't ready to hear what you got, the best thing to do is walk away. Amen? Learn from that, if nothing else. But let's get on into this. So Jesus knew about what they were plotting to do. He withdrew himself from there, from thence, and great multitudes followed him. And notice what it says, and he healed them all. He didn't have to, but our God's a God of mercy. And he charged them. He said, hey, listen, y'all. Don't make it known that I've healed you. Don't go telling everybody. Don't want to make a big deal out of what I've done. He said, don't do it. And here's why. Look at verse 17 and following. We're going we're gonna to get on that, and we're going to stay on that part. That it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, or Isaiah the prophet. All right? Here's what it says in Isaiah chapter 42. He said, Behold my servant, whom I have chosen, my beloved, in whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him, and he shall show judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not strive. That means he's not. he didn't come to fight, right? Nor cry. He didn't come to yell and scream. Neither shall any man hear his voice in the street. He didn't come to dispute and have a big argument and an uproar. That's not why Jesus came. A bruised reed shall he not break, and a smoking flax shall he not quench, till he send forth judgment unto victory. And in his name shall the Gentiles trust. Now the prophecy said he's not going to fight, he's not going to argue, he's not going to shout, he's not going to do any of that. Therefore, that's why... That's exactly why he didn't stay there and try to deal with the situation and argue. He got out of there because the Lord's word said that he wasn't going to stand around and argue. And the Lord done exactly what the word of God says, you understand. Now, I want us to focus on verse 20, and that's what we're going to look at from here on out. We're talking about a God of mercy. I want you to look at that verse there. It says, a bruised reed shall he not break, and a smoking flax shall he not quench. There's two different renderings of that. There's two different understandings of that. I'll give you the first one, and then we'll get into the second one, which is what we're here to, to talk about today. From, from the standpoint of the, the first viewpoint, who is it talking about? A, bruise, uh, a bruised reed and a smoking flax. Who is it referring to? What is it referring to? Well, in the true literal sense of it, I believe it's referring to the Pharisees because that's what they were. They were nothing. And you know what? The Lord could have, at that moment, snuffed them out. He could have snapped them off. He could have, but that's not what he did. He let them be. He, it says, until he bring forth judgment unto victory. See, <clears throat> he's not, he didn't come to judge them. You see, he came to save them. Amen? Even though they hated him, even though they wanted to destroy him, understand something, he still loved them and wanted them to be saved. That's what blows my mind. That's the God we serve. Even though men hate him, he still yet would die for them. That's the amazing part of the God that we live and serve. Now, that's not the sense I want to give you because I want to bring it back to you and I. And I believe God, there's more than one interpretation of this, and I believe God wants us to see this. So let's look here this morning. Let's look at this, this metaphor which God's given through this prophetic scripture of a bruised reed and a smoking flax. We're going to focus on the smoking flax this morning, and that's what we're going to finish up talking about. I want us to look, number one, at the condition that this metaphor that he gives, that it represents. What is, what is, it, what is it talking about? A smoking flax is talking about a state of being where we find ourselves sometimes. feels like there's not much left. There's not much fire left in us. Amen? I remember, I remember after I first surrendered to preach, I rem and I remember it like it was yesterday, 
of course, it's only been 20 years, but but I remember the fire that I had in me. I was so ready to just go challenge. I mean, just uh, somebody told me one time, said, you ready to challenge? You ready to charge hell with a squirt pistol, ain't you? That's what somebody said to me. Well, they were trying to say, you know, you fired up. Well, I had a lot of fire, but I'm going to tell you something. There have been times since then where I felt like the fire just nearly went out. Not that I didn't love the Lord, but the fire got down to a smolder. That's what the smoking flax represents. It represents the fire of God in us, the desire for God, the love of God, the walk with God. It's a state, a condition where there's where there's a little good in you, still a little good in you. It's just a spark. It's barely there, but it's there. Listen to me, if you're saved, I don't care how backslidden you may get. Let me just put it to you like this. I saw a great chart that a guy was doing. He was drawing on, on, on a whiteboard, and he had two different sections. And he had over here a man's flesh. And he'd written down, you know, how a man's flesh will act on this side. And over here, you have a, the spiritual man, the creature created in Christ Jesus, the part of us that, that, that communicates with God, our spirit. And over here, he had written down the attributes of it. And he said, you know, a lot of people say, well, if we can see, if your flesh over here, if that's all we see, well, you're lost. But he said, well, that's not necessarily the case. He said, a man can be saved. Well, let's put it this way. We've, we've been around some preachers. We've been around some godly people in our life that we never did see their flesh. We hadn't really, not really noticed much of their flesh because all, all the time we were around them, they were, they were, praising God, they were serving God. I'll give you an example, Brother Darrell Weaver. I mean, I, I've seen his flesh a little bit, but not much, barely. I mean, I see him get a little ag aggravated at times, and I mean, but for the most of the time, he's joyful nearly all the time you're around him. So you don't see much of his flesh, but guess what? It's there. You aggravate him enough, I guarantee you, he'll try his best, but you know what? After a while, his patience will run out, and you'll see his flesh. I'm sure his wife, Wanda, knows exactly what I'm talking about. But you don't hardly ever see it. But he's, he's still got flesh, right? And yet there are people, listen to me, there are people who are so backslidden and so cold and so distant, they've gone so far away from God that all you can see is their flesh. All you can see is their worldliness. You can't see that God is even in their life hardly at all. But I can tell you something, he's still in there even though you can't see him because all you see is their flesh. Now, both of them people are just as saved as the other. One of them, those are roaring fire, and the others are smoking flags. Amen? You understand what I'm saying this morning? There's just a little bit of faith left still there. Amen? You know what the Bible says about a little bit of faith? The Bible says in Luke 17, 6, the Lord said if you had faith as a grain of mustard seed, which is so, so tiny, you might say unto this sycamine tree, be thou plucked up by the root, and be planted in the sea, and it should obey you. The Lord Jesus said, if you had that much faith. So a little faith, even though it's just a little, is powerful. Because it's not you, it's not the person that holds the faith that makes it powerful. It's the faith they hold. Amen? Even though it's just a spark, it's still there. It's still glowing. Amen? You following me over here? Are you following me over here? Okay, just making sure. See... <clears throat> There's still there's some good in you. You might listen. A person may feel like they're worthless. They may say, "Don't talk about me. Don't brag on me. You don't know how backslid I am." Listen. Don't tell me there's any good in me. I know there's nothing good about me. Well, if you're saved, there is some good in you because God's in you. Amen. There's a there's a desire for you in you for God. Amen. You know what? Maybe you feel worthless. Maybe you feel dirty. Maybe you feel like you don't deserve to even come into God's presence. You may feel like God wouldn't have nothing to do with me, but you still desire Him, even though He a little bit. Even though maybe you're not willing to, maybe somebody's not willing to go to church. They're not willing to, to be around other Christians right now because they're so backslidden and they're embarrassed and they're ashamed. But I can tell you something: they still, in their heart of hearts, when they're alone, when they're quiet, they know they need God. There's still a little bit of desire left. Amen. But you know what? That desire was put there by the Holy Ghost of God. It was created. It may not be a strong desire, but it's there. It's still a smoking flax. Amen? But let me say, it said, I said that there, there is a little bit of good in them. But you know what? That good is 
It's too little to be of much use. That's the problem. I mean, you think about it. If we were in here in this room and the, and it was nighttime and the lights went out and you couldn't see your hand in front of your face and it was cloudy and 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 and, and, and you couldn't see the moon shining through the window. And I'm talking about Africa dark. I'm talking about as dark as night. Amen. Dark as dark can be. And somebody came in with a smoking flat. You say, what's a smoking flat? Well, it's, 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 it's just like a, a a reed growing by the by the riverside or something. And, and it's still burning. It's just barely burning. It's just smoldering. And I walk up and say, hey, I got some light. Can't nobody see nothing by that flax. All they can see is dark everywhere else. <laughs> you can't read by it. Hey, miss, you can't see by it. A smoking flax is not going to do much good to help anybody else. You can't show nobody else the way because you don't know the way yourself. You, all you are is you ain't got enough light to see yourself. That smoking flax is not going to help too many people. Amen. You can't comfort the weak when you're a smoking flax because you need comforting yourself. You can't help too many people. Amen? You can't fight for the Lord on his side because you're too weak to fight when you're nothing but a smoking flax. But you know what you can do? One thing you can do, you can sympathize with other people in the same position. You can at least help those who are in the same condition you're in. See, they may not be able to come to somebody else who's strong in the faith because that person strong in the faith may uh, may be off-putting to them because they're ashamed. But you know what? You can go to somebody where you're at and help them, and by helping them, maybe, maybe, just maybe, you get concerned for somebody else, It'll you'll see that, hey, you need God too. Amen? So I said when you're, when you're in that condition, when you're like a smoking flax, there's a little good in you, but it's not enough to be much use. Can I say this? It, a smoking flax, when that's all that's left, it's kind of unpleasant to another believer to see somebody who's in that condition. A smoking flax is barely burning. Nobody likes to, I don't like to smell when somebody blows a candle out. I don't really know anybody likes to smell somebody blowing a candle out. When that wick still just got a little bit of smoke left on it and it's just, it's not really burning. There's no flame there. It's just a little red glow at the tip, and there's that smoke billowing off of it. And that smoke stinks, amen? It might have been the best. Listen, that candle might have gave off the most wonderful fragrance when it was lit. But when it got down to where it's just smoking, it ain't no pleasant smell at all. And that's kind of the way it is when you get around somebody who's in this condition. Their life may have at one time been a joyous thing. It may have been something you could celebrate with them because they loved the Lord so much. But now you get around them. And I know people like that that used to love God, and now they don't serve God at all. And you talk about it, I don't want to talk about it no more. They're done. They're through. I've pastored many of them that just absolutely, when they left our church, they walked away from God, and they're done. And their life is unpleasant to others around them because they used to be something for God, and now they're not. And what caused them to be that way? Well, maybe it's fears. Maybe their fears in life got to them and it beat them down and they just couldn't trust God that he could do anything for them. Or maybe, again, like doubts. And they say, well, I just, can't, I just don't know if I can depend on God. I've had so many things happen to me. I just don't know if I can depend on God to do this or do that. Or they're worried about the future and they don't know what the future holds. And, and they let all these doubts and fears and worries uh, just compound upon them to the point to where they don't feel the fire of God in their life and they're not looking to God for answers. They're simply become depressed. They've gotten down, they've gotten depressed, and they don't <clears throat> they don't feel like they can do anything for God anymore. So they're nothing but a smoking flax. I said it's a state that there's a little bit of good in you. You're too little it's too little to do any good. And it's unpleasant to other people, but can I tell you this? If you got a spark, if there's still a little bit of burning to you, it's enough good to be dangerous in Satan's eyes. Hear what I'm saying? When the devil hears us groaning over the sin in our life, even though we may be in it and be 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 caught up in it and don't know how to get out of it, but you start saying, oh, God, I hate what I am. I hate what I've become. I hate that this is going on in my life. I hate it. The devil gets upset. Oh, he gets nervous. You say, well, look at that person. They, they may be complaining, but they ain't doing nothing. They're still down there in their misery. 
but they're starting to get uncomfortable in it. That little fire, that's that uncomfortableness that says, I can't stay here because this is not what God intended for me to be. And the devil says, whoa, wait a minute. They're smoking over there. Where there's smoke, there might be fire. You started waking up. You started feeling your need for God. And listen, it makes him nervous. It makes him nervous just like a farmer would get nervous if somebody said, I see just a little bit of smoke coming out of your hay barn. It's just a little bit of smoke, but it's still coming out of your hay barn. I guarantee that farmer wouldn't say, oh, don't worry about it, it's just a little smoke. No, he'd been down there in a hurry with a pail of water to put it out because the whole thing liable to go up at any time. Listen, you say, oh, you don't know where I'm at. I, I, this, I used to be on fire for God, but it just ain't there anymore. And listen, the devil don't like it because you still got a little something left. Amen? So when do people get in this shape? How do people get in the shape? Well, they get to where they're a smoking plaque. Listen, at one time they were a flame. At one time they were lit. Amen. Are you awake over here? You listen? All right. Pay attention. When do people get in this condition where they're a smoking plaque? Well, one, one way they get in that condition is right after the flame gets lit, right after they get saved. I mean, listen, it's a, it's a surprise. And I talked about this in the nursing home last Sunday night. It's a surprise to some people. I think I did. When they get saved, to find out there's going to be some troubles afterwards. I mean, they thought they got saved, everything was going to be great, and they would never have no more troubles anymore because all their problems are over because they're saved now. And all of a sudden, they get hit with problems, and they're like, oh, well, I, just, I thought it's going to be more to it than this. And the fire begins to wane. Or maybe, maybe they just see other Christians who've lived longer and served God longer, and, and, and they feel... They feel like they're unqualified. They feel like they're ill-equipped. They find more sin in their life after they get saved than they thought was there to begin with. I tell you what, that, that, sometimes that can overwhelm you as well. You set out to serve God, and, and right off right out the gate, you begin to find out, well, wait a minute, this is wrong. I've been doing this for a long time, and God don't like that either, and this brings the shame on God. And, and you know, pretty soon it's like, well, everything around me is wrong. What do I do? And you get overwhelmed. That happens, and I can tell you something, and I and I and don't don't mis misjudge me on what I'm about to say, and I've been guilty of it myself. A lot of times, those of us who've been saved a while expect people who just got saved to get to where we are overnight. It didn't take us overnight to get there. It took us a long time to get there, and oftentimes it's it's the judgmental behavior of those who've been saved a long time expecting young believers to snap their fingers and be full grown that caused that fire to them because you can't get again you can't get there overnight it takes growth it takes a while it takes getting to know the lord and walking with him and it whatever it is it dampens that light until it's almost not even there i said it happens when the when the when the flame's just been lit Sometimes it happens when the flame's almost burned up. person gets to the end of their life. Maybe they feel like they can't do much for God anymore. But you know what? Just because this old carriage we're riding around in gets wore out and the wheels start coming off, it doesn't mean that what God created inside of us has changed any. It doesn't matter. And I, and I used to tell people this when we go out to nursing home. There ain't no old folks home for Christians. You don't retire. There's no museum for Christians. You don't put a Christian on a shelf and say God's done with them because God is never done with you until he takes you off the shelf of this earth and takes you up to his His trophy cabinet up in glory. Amen? God ain't never done with you down here. So there's no reason for that light to go out just because of age. Listen, just because you get older don't mean you can't be useful for God. Amen? God needs prayer warriors. God needs, listen, as long as your mouth still works, you can serve God. As long as you can still talk to people. So the end of life can't end it. <clears throat> and other people, they say, well, I'm so depressed. I'm just depressed. Somebody might say, well, that, people shouldn't get depressed. They shouldn't. Well, the man who was the man after God's own heart, old David, King David. King David got depressed. Listen to what he said in Scripture. Psalm 42, 11, he said, Why art thou cast down, O my soul? Why art thou disquieted within me? You know what he was saying? I'm depressed. 
I'm very sad and depressed. Why art thou disquieted with me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him who is the health of my countenance and my God. He had gotten down. He had gotten depressed. He was looking at everything around him. Everybody around him was trying to get him. His life looked like it was, was coming to an end, and he was depressed about the whole situation. But yet he said, I, I'll praise God. I'm going to hope in God. What was he saying? My flax is barely smoking, but it's still smoking. Amen. That little, that little glimmer, that little, that little orange spark is still there. You can barely see it, but it's still there. When our soul gets in that condition, we start being a smoking flax. Sometimes worldliness damps our flame. Sometimes, I mean, this world's overwhelming. I mean, especially the world we live in today. It's so much different than it was when y'all grew up, when I grew up. It's so much different now for these kids today. Listen, they're growing up in a world that's like Sodom and Gomorrah everywhere we look. It's filthy and it's vile. And just getting around it and, and just and just getting getting it in your ears, getting it in your eyes, getting it in your in your your consciousness will wear you down. It'll beat you down. Seeing this filth of this world day in and day out will wear you down. And listen. And, it, and it, sometimes it seems like it's just about to smother out the fire of God in your life. There's reasons why people get in that shape. There's reasons why. And listen, and there's another one. Maybe a strong wind's blown on it for a long time. Temptations of this life. Trials of this life. Things just come into your life and beat you down. And like I said, we may have been one time in our life, we might have been roaring flames, but... High wind blew our flame out and just kept blowing and blowing and blowing. And now that it's settled down, we're just a little old smoldering flame. I'm going to tell you, I felt like that for a long time. I mean, I ain't got to go through my history, but I, we've, had some, we've had some storms. I've had some wind blow against me till it like to blew me down where I didn't know where I was going to get back up again. But I praise God. That little smoldering flame still there. A little smoldering flax. So let me, let me get to the third point, and here's the most important. What does Jesus do with people when they're in this state? I mean, we found out there ain't much good about us when this condition. We see why we get in that condition. But what does he do with us once we're there? Well, he's not going to quench us, for first of all. That's the main thing. The Lord is not going to say, that's it. We're done with you. You once were a flame, but now you're just a spark. That's enough. No. The Bible says he won't quench us. The smoking flax, he shall not quench. He won't quench you by pronouncing a legal judgment on you and saying, hey, you know what? You're not good enough. You've done this and you've done that and you've done this and that, and therefore you don't measure up. He won't ever do that. God, that ain't who we serve. Listen to me. The Bible tells us in Psalm 143, verse 2, And enter, in, enter not into judgment with thy servant, for in thy sight shall no man living be justified. Praise God. I thank God that he's not my judge. Hallelujah. All my judgment was put on him on Calvary. He'll never judge me like that. Amen. He'll never judge me according to my sin. I praise God for that. Amen. Just because I'm, just because I have been a smoking flex, just because life has beat me down and I and I have backslidden against him, he will not look at me and say, "Well, you've gone too far now, you're out." He'll never do that to me. Isn't that wonderful to know that God? Listen, there ain't nobody among us so good that they can go before Jesus and say, "Well, Jesus, I'm a good person, so you need to let me into heaven." I ain't a single one. Ain't nobody in the world. If Jesus were to judge us according to his judgment, there is no one, not one single person, who could get into heaven on that basis. So thank God it's because of the blood that's been shed. Listen, because I'm under that blood, because it's washed me clean, listen, because of that, I know Jesus isn't going to snuff me out when I'm, when I'm a smoking flax. He won't quench me, listen, by setting up some high high standard of experience that I'm supposed to have in order for him to not put me out. There are people just within a mile of us in a church, more than likely, who are having an altar call 
and there are people that are coming down to that altar call that are that are talking in all kinds of jibber jabber and claiming that they're speaking a special language from God that only that only uh somebody over here that says they know what they're saying can understand. I'm gonna tell you something, that's not godly. That's not what the Bible teaches over there in 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 First Corinthians. And I can tell you what, we got more time, we'll go back and talk about it. But I can tell you that that is not of God. That's not godly. There are people up in the hills of, of Kentucky and 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 Tennessee and Arkansas that are in church this morning, and they got a big rock and roll band up on the platform, and they're going away. And there's preachers reaching into uh, baskets, and they're carrying rattlesnakes around while they're while they're rolling their eyes back in their head and jibber jabbering in tongues and things of that nature. And they saying, if you don't do that, you're not saved. And them who fall flopping around in the floor and shaking and quivering and jibber-jabbering, they're saying, if you're not doing that, you're not saved. If you're not slain in the Spirit, something, you ain't saved. I'm going to tell you something. I wasn't. I ain't done none of that, and I ain't going to do none of that because that ain't in the Bible to do that. And I'll tell you right now, I'm as saved as saved can be, not because I did anything, but because he saved me. There is no achieved level of supposed holiness that we have to reach in order for God to not say, well, I'm done with you, because God's not going to be done with you. He won't do it by setting up some standard you got to live up to. Listen, he won't judge you, he won't quench you by a lofty standard of knowledge. God does not expect us to be so far along or he will get rid of us. No, God doesn't do that. That's not how Jesus operates. He's a God of mercy. Amen? <coughs> I've been around those kind of folks too who look down their their sharp noses at me because I didn't know everything they knew. As if they had reached some level that I would never reach. Uh, there are a lot of people like that. It's a shame that there are people like that. Listen, by the grace of God, we're all but nothing but, but, but dirt. That's all we are. But by the grace of God, there's none of us that we get so high and lifted up that God says, oh, well, now they've arrived. Listen, we're all children of God. Amen? Those of us that are saved. You know, talking about that, God expecting us to hit some lofty level of knowledge. I love my boys. I love my girl, too, but I love my boys. And I love I love them. I loved them when they were little, but when they when they came into this world and I looked in that little bassinet, I didn't say, "Well, I'll love you when you're grown, but not until you're grown." I, you know, I don't look at my daughter and say, "Well, I I, I don't love you now because you're a little girl. I, I'll love you when you're a grown woman." See, that'd be kind of like God looking at us and say, "I I don't care nothing about you because you're little. You're smoking flax. You don't know much." So I'll just get rid of you. No, he loves us when we're little. He loves us all along the way. He's a God of mercy. He knows we didn't come into this thing, like I said, fully formed. He knows it's a growth process. So he's not going to quench us on account of that. And I'll tell you another one. He's not going to measure us or quench us by setting up a standard to measure our grace. And I'm going to tell you what I mean by that. I have heard preachers say, well, bless God, you didn't get what I got when I got down in that altar. I come up my chain. I ain't going back ever to be the way I was before. Bless God, I'm a different man, and I'll never be the same again. I'm going to tell you something. They've been preachers said stuff like that. Sounds good. It gets a lot of shouts and amens. But the truth of it is, they fell down too. They've been backslidden too. It's not, well... So much faith and you're saved, so much faith and you're lost. It's not, it's not, well, you don't have, you didn't get as much grace as I got. Listen, it's not that at all. God's grace is sufficient. God's grace is available. God, God saves by his grace. Amen. You didn't get more grace than I got. But yet there, there are people out there who will try to, to make you lost because you're not at their standard. You understand what I'm saying? There, there are preachers out there who I used to call my friends who judge people harshly if they're not living right there at that level where they feel like everybody ought to be. And they know who they are if they heard me say it. And it's not right. I'm going to tell you why I say that. Because listen to me, that person, that believer that's just a smoking flax, that, for whatever reason, why they're there, 
for whatever reason, why, how they got to the point to where they feel like there ain't no fire hardly left in them at all. That's still a child of God. That's still somebody Jesus died for. That's still somebody that Jesus wants to grow up and be mature and, and turn out to be something. Regardless of whether they, they got cold and back said, regardless of whether they're full of fear, regardless of whether they're full of doubt and worry, regardless of whether life has crushed them, regardless of whether the trials of life has blown them down to where they're almost out, regardless of how they got there, they are still just as saved as the one who thinks they've got it all together. Matter of fact, they may be more. Hey, they may actually be saved, and the one who thinks they've got it all together may not be because they're full of pride and don't even know what they are. Jesus is in the business. Not a, Hey, listen, the righteous, he didn't call the righteous. He called sinners to repentance. Amen. Those who, are, those who see themselves as self-righteous, I don't know whether they know him or not. But I'm going to tell you something good about Jesus. Let me tell you what Jesus will do if you're smoking flax. The Bible says he won't, he, won't, he won't extinguish it. He won't quench it. You know what he'll do? He'll protect you. Because that's who he is. He'll protect you. He'll take you in his hand. Y'all ever seen on these survival shows where they take that little bundle of stuff that looks like hay or something and they'll hit that, hit that striker? And they'll get a spark in there, and it ain't blood, it ain't burning yet. There's just a spark in that pile. And what do they do? They take it in their hands, and they gently blow. Then it begins to smoke. Then it smokes. Then suddenly, a flame is there, and they take that flame and they add more wood to it, and more wood to it, and suddenly they got a roaring fire. What will Jesus do for us? He'll take us in his hand and he'll blow on us gently with his soft breath of love and he'll get that fire going in us. Oh, if we'll go to him, he'll, he'll get us flaming back up and a burning fire again. Listen, he'll blow on you with his, with his Holy Spirit. He'll bring verses of Scripture back to your remembrance. Remembrance. He'll, he'll warm your heart again. He'll, he'll bring... He'll bring to your mind great and precious promises of the Word of God and restore your soul. Listen, He'll, he'll bring to you kind friends and, and, and loved ones, brothers and sisters in Christ who will, who will share with you their experience of when they were down to, to comfort you and help you and lift you up. Because Christ doesn't desire for us to stay a smoking flax. He doesn't desire for us to stay a babe in Christ. He wants us to grow up. I mean, it's, it's very, there's very little in this world that's as, that is as cute as a baby in a stroller. But a grown man in a stroller isn't cute. A grown woman in a stroller isn't cute. God doesn't want us to stay babies. You know that passage of scripture Kelly read yesterday at her wedding, where she didn't, where she stopped right down below it. Here's what it says. It says, "When I was a child, I spake as a child." I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. He says, for now we see through a glass darkly. We're like looking out the smoky window. We can't really see through. But then face to face. Now I know in part. But then I shall know even as I also I am known. Right now, right now, I may, I may just be a smoking flax. Right now, maybe I, I can't see what God intends for me to be. But I'm going to tell you, as I grow, as I come to know Him, as I grow to love Him and grow to, 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 to desire God and, and get to know Jesus and get closer to Him, that fire begins to burn. What that scripture says? While I mused, the fire burned. thought on the things of God. I thought of how God was good to me. thought of how God loved me. And the fire began to burn. And you know what happens? I begin to grow. I begin to grow little by little, and little by little, step by step, day by day, as I walk with Jesus and I get to know Jesus, He fans that flame and it grows and grows and grows and until it gets larger and larger and I'm able to be what He wants me to be. Listen, the Bible says in 1 Peter 2, 2 and 3, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the Word that you may grow thereby. 
if so be that you've tasted that the Lord is gracious. Thank God that we have a God of mercy. Thank God that Jesus doesn't just throw us out when we when we fail, when we when we, when we get backwards on what we ought to be. Thank God He doesn't do us like the religious Pharisees would do and say, you're no good, you're a castaway, you're done, you're over with. No, the Lord is in the business of restoring things that other people look at and say are done. They say are no good. They say are without strength or without use. Jesus is in the business of taking things and being merciful and restoring them to a greater glory than they ever had before. Getting to know the Lord. Listen, I'm thankful that my Lord is a, is a Lord of mercy that my Lord doesn't give up on people. Amen. Thank God he hadn't give up on you. Thank God he hadn't give up on me. Listen, I don't know what our needs are this morning. I don't know everything in your life, but I can tell you this. If you've been feeling like you, the fire in you is going out, I can tell you this. You can get next to Jesus. You tell him your heart's desire. The devil will get nervous, and Jesus will get busy restoring the flame in your life. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we do love you and we thank you and we praise you. Lord God, we ask you that you might help our understanding, Lord. Bless us and grow us in the word. Lord, I pray you'd restore the fire, Lord, that once was in us. Lord, there's somebody out there this morning, Lord, that needed this message. There's somebody out there this morning who felt like, Lord, maybe they're, maybe they're down and depressed and sad and they just, they don't know why they can't they can't ever find the joy of being a child of God anymore. Lord, I just pray that you'll restore that joy and that peace in their heart. Lord, that you'll restore that flame of fire in them. Lord God, I pray for the one, Lord, who's 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 just cold and indifferent. Oh Father, I pray, Lord, that you break through that ice. The ice around their heart, Lord, that you'd warm them. Lord, you'd restore them. Father, I pray, Lord, for the one that's lost. Lord, that they'd put their eyes upon Jesus, that they would look and live, that they would turn from their darkness and their path of sin, Lord, that they'd turn. Lord, I pray you, Holy Ghost of God, you go to where they are right now. Lord, that you convict them, you bring them to conviction and show them their loss, show them their sin, show them, Lord, hell that awaits them if they continue on that path. Lord God, touch their heart, touch their life, turn them in repentance, Lord. Give, grant them grace under repentance that they might turn to Jesus. Kneel at the cross of Calvary. Have the blood of Jesus Christ wash their sins away and be born again that they might believe that he died, was buried, and rose from the grave. Father, we pray this morning, Lord, that you restore us, that you revive us and renew us. Thank you ahead of time, Father. We thank you, Lord, that Jesus is a God of mercy and we give you praise and honor for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.